You are listening to Be The Change, a podcast of conversations with true visionaries who are creating new paradigms for a healthier planet and society. I am your host, Christine Demick, and my work is in finding real solutions to the biggest problems we face today, climate crisis, capitalism, social injustices, and our failing health. There are amazing humans out there that have answers, and it is my mission to have their voices heard. Together, we can raise consciousness and create a just and equal society. Together, we can be the change. How do we start the change to partner with nature instead of trying to control it? Could it be as simple as how we landscape? My next guest thinks so. Monique Allen is the founder and creative director of the award-winning Garden Continuum, a landscape design and gardening company. With a resume that includes not just homes, but commercial landscape, municipal park development, and floodplain restoration, Monique has taken her work to words with her recent book, Stop Landscaping and Start Lifescaping. Today, she shares with us how planning and creating a landscape that is in harmony with nature will translate to harmony in our home life. Welcome, Monique. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you so much. It's really great to be here, Christine. I got to tell you, your podcast has just been such a delight for me to listen to because I feel like I'm you keep bringing on my people. (laughs) It's awesome. So thank you. Thank you you for that. It's a joy to have you on. And Monique, your book came to me. It came to my attention while I was researching my talk with Noah Wilson Rich, which was a couple episodes ago. And he's the bee protector. And I was intrigued because landscaping is actually very high up on the list of changes we can make to personally support the environment. You know, your book begins with the idea that we landscape our yards, but we don't spend any time in it. Um, And in fact, it can be off-putting. So tell me a little bit about your philosophy in landscaping and how it differs from what we know as the norm. Definitely. And, you know, I got to speak to the title, you know, stop landscaping, start lifescaping. And here I am, I own a landscaping company. And I always kind of remind people that are listening that I'm being a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but I'm trying to make a substantive change in how we think of the word because the word landscape can be applied to a lot of things. You can have a corporate landscape, you know, and we're not talking about plants. We're talking about how the culture and the people and, and then you put the ING and now we're landscaping. Now it's a verb and it's a thing and nobody really knows what that thing is. And it when we try to systematize it and process it and make it predictable, it's kind of like we steam clean it and and we do it and repeat it and do it, repeat it. And, you know, I got sucked into that early on. I've been doing this for 36 years. And what I found was that the landscape was doing something profoundly beneficial for me. I was somewhat troubled. I was dealing with some trauma and When I met the soil, when I met plants, when I met that garden environment at 18 years old, I had a grounding, a huge grounding. I don't understand it, you know, no clue. I just kept following it, you know, I just kept following it and got sucked up into conventional landscape work. And I think probably because I'm a woman and probably because I loved flowers, I was able to sort of stay on the periphery and I ended up being the flower girl for the landscaper guys. And so I was bringing the pretty. And so it turned from bringing the pretty to bringing the health, bringing the vitality, bringing the connection, starting to to make it more of an integrated part of the home. And I didn't have any of the language for that. So I just kept doing the work. And ultimately what I'm learning and what I've evolved to understand is that what we're doing is regenerative. It's regenerative to the soul, to the spirit, and to the land, and to the soil, and feeds the climate. And so lifescaping became this kind of term that I grabbed to say, Well, I don't want to feature scape because that's a Pinterest board and house and all the things like pretty, pretty big stuff. It's the throwaway culture. It's the accumulation culture. Um, I don't want to dead scape, which many of the landscapes that we have in the suburbs are dead. So they're living, but they're dead. And that's why they end up being these 
deserts for pollinators. There's all this growing stuff, but nothing's really alive. Mm. And so I was juxtaposing landscape, deadscape, featurescape, and saying all of that is not actually doing the job. What we need to do is lifescape. We need to create connectivity between nature and human and then all the life forces that from the soil microbes that we can't see to the bees and birds and everything else. And then this is the part about me making it about business is then say, you can also have profit and you move into your triple bottom line. You move into long-term sustainable green practice that is also long-term sustainable economic practice. And that, that synergy became just creates this really beautiful triple bottom line, but you don't just flip a switch and do it. So the book was really to try to peel apart what I was doing through following this thread. And I had to like back up and kind of codify it so that I could understand it and then teach it. Interesting. I mean, there's so much to unpack there, right? In that whole, <laughs> that whole opening, right? Here we are in the beginning and it's like, wow. I mean, <laughs> it's always intuitive. And a lot of people think, so how are you educated on this? And of course, I know you do have education on it. I mean, you have an incredible resume, but that first blip was, it felt good. You were going through trauma and going to the earth and working with it, you just continued because it felt good, right? Absolutely. Because in that space, I felt like I could deal with what my brain actually couldn't deal with. I had spent so much of my childhood surviving and just, you know, just getting it done, getting it done, getting it done and staying afloat and keeping my head up that when I got to that place, all of a sudden it didn't feel like a struggle. I mean, I was working hard. You sweat, you work, you get dirty, whatever. Mm. But there was a grounding and I went out of my brain. I went out of the spin of the brain into more of the intelligence of the mind, the body, the spirit, all of that without, like we were joking before, without being woo-woo. It was really connectivity that is like our birthright as humans, yeah. And I think, I mean, and this is exactly why I wanted to have you on. I was reading your book and and I could see that you are bringing this in an obtainable, easy way for anyone who has a home to reconnect with our planet. And that's what this is about. Have you seen the movie Earthing? Have you watched that yet? I haven't watched Earthing, no. Okay, so I'll send it to you after this, but I hope in everyone listening, you know, it was sent to me and listen, it's even made goop now, you know, so like, I guess it's a, it's a thing, but it is shown that when we are barefoot and on the grass, that our heart rates go down. Like it actually, we are healing ourselves. We are meant to be in touch with nature, not to control it and not to manipulate it, but to be in it, right? And to live in harmony. And that is what your work is. So thank you, Monique. Oh, you're you're welcome. And you know, I think that, so one of the things um, I teach at the Master Gardeners Association in Massachusetts. I'm a faculty educator there. And every year I teach the same class over and over. And it's the title sometimes will morph. This year we decided to call it the sustainable landscape. And in that, one of the things that I'm very clear about is that as soon as we touch and manipulate, because that's part of what we do. It's like we manipulate clay to make a beautiful bowl we manipulate the earth to make beautiful gardens. So I'm very careful to make sure that people understand that we are putting our hand in it. We are putting our force upon it. When we go in there and we, and we do it in partnership, we say, I'm coming in and I'm going to, I'm going to moosh things around. You're not doing it with blinders on. Instead, what you're doing is you're looking up and around to see what is this environment naturally. And so often you go into a neighborhood and there is no natural, there is nothing that would have been there. So you actually have to go a little bit farther out and see, you know, how do you create a living zone within a desert. And interestingly, my property, I sit on two and a half acres on a, on a small sort of arc of a road that has 16 houses. And 
they're all one acre lots except mine and the one next to it. And mine is two and a half acres. And we were lucky enough to have somebody sort of door to door sell us an aerial photograph of our house. And you could sort of see the other houses. And 10 years later, the same people came and sold us another aerial photograph. It's remarkable. It's like we're this green patch in a desert. And the regenerative landscape creates this incredible life zone. And if we could create those as connected little plots, we'd have stepping stones for the bees, let's say, yeah. right? Where you would create these beautiful pathways and these ribbons that were connected. So yeah, it's just this thread and I keep following it. Like you said, with your company and how then the podcast was born, it's like the education comes through I think a desire to understand the feeling and ask, how do I get that more? How do I understand why it's coming and how do I make it somewhat predictable so that I can lean into it as a real mechanism for living? Yes. And uh, so I'm thrilled to share you with the audience today. So people out there now, how they can learn to do this besides getting your book. Of course, everyone, you have to get Monique's book, Stop Landscaping and Start Lifescaping. Please get it. But what are some of the steps that we can go through and that we can do in our own home? The very first step is to breathe. (laughs) (laughs) That is the first step. The trip up for homeowners and landscape professionals alike is that we're all caught up in the rush. We're all caught up in what the world has become, which is very instant gratification and very rushy. And the subtitle of the book is, is a guide to ending the rush, rush, humdrum approach to landscape development and care, right? So step one is to breathe because when you breathe, you generally slow down. We all have to embrace that the pace of working in nature is much slower than the pace of, let's say, developing a podcast or being on digital media where we learn that things are very, very quick. So that's step one. And step two is to take stock of where you are now. Um, And that's a critical step. When I did, I worked on a big restoration of the Charles River here in Medfield, Massachusetts. And in the process, people who were incredibly well-meaning were shoving plant lists in my face. We want these plants. We want these plants. We want fish. We want birds. We want that land. They kept shoving all of these native species to me. And these were you know, big organizations to very concerned citizens. And, you know, I dutifully took everything. And then I put on my my head to toe, you know, waders and wellies and whatever. And I went out into the wetland and cataloged the plants. And there were fewer than a dozen plants there. And the fewer than a dozen plants are the plants that I planted. Mm-hmm. And I told them, I said, okay, all this stuff that you're giving me is lovely. It's lovely but it's not part of the ecosystem that wants to be here. So when we go back to that idea of manipulating, we've got to go back to that, the beauty of the human being that is able to manipulate its environment and say, but we must consider the environment. Yeah. So that's the plants were native though. So that's interesting. So they came with you well-intentioned with native plants, Yes. but those plants, didn't happen to be growing there, which could mean that, you know, they wouldn't have survived. And even though it means it's native, like you have to consider the soil, you have to. And so let's not try to put a square peg in a round hole, right? Yeah. Or a big square peg in a small round hole or a small square hole. So what happens when things become commoditized and even native plants, you know, it's becoming commodity, right? Mm -hmm. So when things become commoditized, what happens is we are basically allowing product to dictate process. Mm. And in the book, I talk a lot about, we don't want to follow the product. We want to follow the system. And the system of nature is not for us to decide. It is. It's for us to explore and to unpack understanding that oftentimes we're walking as landscape professionals, we're often walking into highly, highly disturbed environments. And so you keep telescoping out so that you can find what the native flora and fauna is and what you're trying to attract versus what you're trying to plant. And then I am absolutely not a purist. I would never say that you should not plant 
something that is, let's say, exotic to our area or a cultivated variety, as long as it's purposeful, it's supportive, and it's not dangerous. You're not you're inviting something terrible. But a good example of that is, you know, bamboo, which doesn't really belong here. Mm-hmm. And mostly I tell people do not plant it because it's it's a dangerous runner. But there are some bamboos that are very clump forming. And I actually have one particular type that I've found is really, really manageable. And I've put it in my woodland mm. in key spots that direct you along a path. And I tell folks, okay, so I planted that the same way I would put a table or a bench. Okay, it's a living feature, but for the pollinators, it's dead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just like a bench. Yeah. So I don't feel bad about it. I'm using it very mindfully as this like bamboo bench that's really a bamboo plant. Yeah. And then all around it, I have you know mountain laurels and there's lady slipper coming up and there's all this wonderfulness. So it's the yes and approach of just following the system of nature and allowing yourself to express some creativity within the construct of that particular ecological slice of land that you're working on. I love that. I love that. So it's like, you know, it's adding little bits, but not going overboard. I think you, know, you were talking about how it's so fast. And I was, this is probably going back about 10 years ago. My son was four. We took him out to the Hampton. And I remember one morning standing there and the landscaping came by. <laughs> and they came by in a truck. There's probably about six guys. And no joke, the truck didn't even stop moving. People, they jumped out. They had their weed whackers. They had their things. And it was just like they just did the whole cul-de-sac, right? Within like an hour. And they were out of there. And I was like, whoa. And then everyone also has the same thing, like hydrangeas. Now, hydrangeas, where are they native to? Like, I remember my my late mother saying she was so upset she had hydrangeas. that she almost wanted to rip them out because she realized they look pretty, but they don't do anything, right? No, No, they, they don't. And so what I try to get people to understand is that while the hydrangeas don't do anything, they're very pretty. So if you remember in the book on lifescaping, there are three components of a lifescape. Yes. There's the organization piece, there's the health piece, and then there's the wow piece. It's going to be very hard to tell people they can't have wow because wow is what makes the heart flutter. And we like that as humans. We like wow. We like wow. So what we need to do is we need to mindfully choose the wow and then surround it with that that piece that supports the ecosystem. So a good example is I'm actually working on a property right now and the client just wanted hydrangeas. I mean, it's just really what she wanted. And I'm not going to tell her no. Yeah. But what I then did was surrounded them with all of these wonderful plants that would create ground pollination habitat and then sort of mid-story pollination habitat so that, you know, the bee might go from the viburnum to the hydrangea and be like, what the heck? And then go down to the geranium and be like, woohoo, you know, so it's just a pit stop. And so we can, yes, and the whole thing, as long as we understand sort of that 80-20 rule, right? Yeah. Is that 20% can be what I would call inert plants. And then 80%, we want to be much more productive, supportive, and life building. And now you're like, woohoo, lifescape. I would like to think that everyone is doing this altruistically, but it's not. It's like most people, you know, they want that wow. But let's, but if we can talk about that other, you know, when we plant that, the native species, or when we think about the bees, we think about the mycelium, we think about our regenerating the earth. How does that benefit the homeowner? What does that translate to? Less it's pesticide a, use, less invasive bugs? Well, it's a great question. And I will give you two answers. And the first answer is the very subtle change that you will see in a client that I see in my clients, sometimes not so subtle, where you have an interest, an initial interest. So so as a business owner, what you do is you solve the top of mind problem. If you try to go too deep, too fast, 
you're going to lose the potential of the sale. So if I try to go too deep into building soil biology, the client's going to glaze over. They're not going to get it. I want to sequester carbon. That's what I want to do. I want climate change to slow down and I want to be a part of that equation. My client wants their landscape to look good. Yeah, Their landscape is a vehicle for my mission. So we have to sort of connect these two. Most people that come to my company are coming because they also, you know, my avatar is the high awareness client. I'm not looking for high-end rich people. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for high awareness, which is why I wrote the book because I can't meet people where they are. But if I write the book, they can see it. So to answer the question, I know I'm being a little long about this, but to answer the question, when a client begins to interact with their finished landscape, they start to feel a change in themselves. And I can tell you that repeatedly, I have clients who oftentimes quite wealthy, have many homes or a second home, and often dash to the second home because it's the getaway place. This is like the real home and that's their getaway. They will actually say to me, I kind of don't even want to leave. Mm. And I've had that happen where I'll work with one partner and then the other partner's kind of like the leaving partner. And then that leaving partner's all like, hey, what if we stay here tonight and eat breakfast here and then go, Mm -hmm. you know? So there's this subtle shift that on balance isn't really that subtle, but they don't even know what the language is, but they find themselves falling in love with the feeling that they have in their landscape. And I see this time and time and time again. And it's really lovely because I don't need to explain to them that they have a vibrational energy coming out of their soil now from all of the living microbes in there that is just off-gassing all this yummy into their soul. And they don't get it and they don't know it. Maybe they don't want to hear it. Some of them want to talk woo-woo with me all day long. (laughs) But the bottom line is not only do they get the wow in a way they can't even believe and much faster, but they get this underlying health vitality, which vibrates right into the core of their cellular structure. And that's where the change is. Beautiful. So it's feeding them. It's feeding them. It's feeding them. And then they continue. Yes. You mentioned that in your book that one should start with the purpose, the vision, and the experience. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Yes. So it's going back to lifescaping as related to building a life and buying a home, starting a family, getting a dog. I mean, all of this is life developing. And we have to have vision. I think a lot of times in business, there's, you know, oh, what's your business vision? What's your business why? But the truth is like, do you have a partner vision? Do you have a family mission statement? Like, do you have all of this? And so I'm trying to get people to start to think about their land as an integral part of how they live their lives. So you have an eight-year-old son, right? Oh, no, he's 14 now. Oh, he's 14 now. Oh, oh, it was eighth grade. He just graduated eighth grade. Right, right, right. Okay. So so he's heading off into high school. Well, in four years, he'll be heading off to college. Mm -hmm. And you might be like, oh, the one thing I really want to do is I want to throw him a beautiful graduation party. Mm -hmm. And you're thinking about that now. And I know you said you just have a little terrace and not a big yard, but like just thinking about what do I want to do in my property? What would I like to do in the future that I might be able to see what is the runway to getting there? Mm. How do I want to interact with my family? How do I want to interact with my friends? For me, growing food is huge. And for years I had like a farm, a little farm in in my front yard. And I got overrun with woodchucks and I, I, ugh, I couldn't deal. The, no fence would work. It was awful. And so I just gave up for a while and I started to dream about a potager garden. So a potager is a garden where it's really highly designed and it often has you know, a patio and seating. And it's very like, pick the food, sit down, eat it. Like it's about sitting and being in your productive garden. And so I started dreaming about this and it took me, I don't know, five years to really figure it out. And then um, Mother's Day, two years ago, my husband 
gave me, my husband and the kids drew me this beautiful picture and gave me my pottery garden for Mother's Day. And then that winter he built it. And wow. it's like that pace, that long pace of dream, vision, plan, design, build mm. is the iterative process of it allows you to create something that has incredible, incredible value in how you live. And a little add to that is it got built. And then three months later, the whole country shut down and I got to grow food and sit in that garden, socially distanced. And I got to visit with my friends in that space. Who knew? Who knew? But that's what I mean about going slow. And then that, that pace of starting with the dream and allowing the dream to become more solid and concrete until it actually becomes the plan that you follow. So a few things I want to say about this. One, my girlfriend lives upstate. Huge problem with the woodchucks. Um, oh. We laugh. She sends me pictures every day of the creatures and like what they're doing. And so she's now, she just starts giving them like her food. So she had chipmunks, but she was giving them like a watermelon. I, you know, she had like a leftover, like the rind, you know, which mm -hmm. they thoroughly enjoyed. But Instead of trying to control the creatures, so you stop that. Like, uh, listen, I come from Ohio. I know people that shoot woodchucks. And uh, I'm sure it happens in Jersey too. And, you know, it's not just Ohio. So instead of like trying to kill the creatures, which are serving their own purpose, right? Mm -hmm. But are also annoyance. You created this potager's garden, which I don't know anything about, but is it less creature friendly and more human friendly? Like, have you had less robbing of your food? I've definitely had less robbing of my food. So yeah. my, my gardens are 25 inches above the ground. So I built them as boxes. So okay. this That's also helps. That's cottager's garden. Yeah. What it, is yeah cottager, so I think it's a French word. So it's and potager? Potager. <laughs> and my box is 25 inches up because I've been landscaping for 36 years and I'm somewhat broken. I both in my back, my neck. I was in a car accident that kind of screwed yeah. up my back. So yeah. I needed the height. And I built it high enough that, and anybody can go onto my website, go into the gallery or portfolio, and you'll see pictures of this garden. And if you go into the blog and search home vegetable garden, there's a whole video of me building this garden because I wanted to show all the steps, like all the layers. So I put wire mesh and then I put stone and then I put fabric and then I put my soil and this is all 20. So nobody can tunnel up and they won't crawl in. Oh. Um, and I have no fence because I didn't want a fence. Yeah. I did fence the back for deer, but as I say, I have two and a half acres. So I only fence that back acre and I, the front is open, but here's the thing, because I'm working in a regenerative practice, I actually want all the wildlife. Yeah. So when we try to take one out, what happens is you disrupt the balance of the prey predator and you need to have the whole ecosystem in order for it to work. So I have resident foxes. I've got resident bunnies. I don't really have the woodchuck anymore because I think we had a fisher in the back and he okay. got the woodchuck. I think my husband's heard coyotes, but I certainly never seen one. Yeah. We have great horned owl. Oh. Um, we have red tail hawk. So we have a lot of predators. And then we have all the little prey animals. And I had a huge bunny problem and we seeded our lawn has clover in it. And I, the bunnies are out and they're eating the clover. They want the clover. Yeah. So I think that there is a way we have to make peace. And I loved listening to Noah Wilson Rich on your show when he was talking about like people being afraid of bees and that that was like part of natural selection. And maybe there was something yeah. going on in our DNA where fear keeps us safe. We live and then we survive. Right. Yeah. But I think just kind of lowering that charge so that when you see a fox, you're not afraid. Yeah. Yeah. Instead, same you're with like, sharks. Oh, ooh, fox. <laughs> yeah, so awesome. same with sharks. Yeah. It's same, like, yes. You know, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. And like I'm a paddleboarder, stand up paddleboarder, and I'm of course deathly afraid of sharks. I don't want to be his lunch, but that's the shark's habitat. Yeah. And so I have to figure out how to coexist in some way. And I think that that's just a challenge for us because I think we've gotten kind of away from allowing the whole food chain to actually exist in one place. 
And that isn't to say that like the woodchucks don't make me angry and the bunnies don't make me angry because they're adorable and they do make me angry. Yeah. Oh. But but I figured out how to cohabitate with them. That's great. I, is cohabitate. You have to. It's not up for us to go into the oceans and control the sharks or the animals. I mean, they're part of it and they serve their purpose as we serve our purpose. And I think that's just so important. Although I live in the city, right? And so landscaping isn't really happening here. We're hopefully purchasing a property, which will be on a Caribbean island. And it's a much different climate. Mm-hmm. And many of the things can be very dry and they're having issues, you know, as many people are. And particularly, let's talk about, like, let's bring this into Cali since this is a U.S. conversation. And we've all seen the pictures where people are in droughts, but they're spending the water on their lawns. My aunt is staying in a home in Malibu right now. And the what their solution was, they used what we called the iceberg plant. I'm not mm-hmm. sure what it is, but it's a succulent. That's just, that's the grass. Yeah. People should start thinking that way, right? And it would also kind of leave them like with less trauma and less water bills. Yeah. So I think it's a, it's a really complex equation. And again, this is why product thinking is our knee jerk because we ask the question, what should I use instead of lawn? And the more sustainable question is, how do I build the soil so that I can sustain vegetation that would then serve whatever the purpose is that I want? So if I want to kick a soccer ball around, it's going to be hard to kick that around on a succulent. If a person has a decent sized yard and can plant with indigenous and native species that are supported by soils that they really need, which means you're putting money in the soil more than you're putting money in the plant. And then let's say they have a little strip of synthetic turf, or they have a little teeny tiny strip of lawn where they can throw a ball. That's not bad. We want to make sure that we're again, yes, anding the equation. So I think part of the issue, so a big part of what we do is we do soil regeneration with every project. So most of the soil that we come in contact with, especially with new construction, is really dead. It's really bad. And so we have to rebuild it. And so whether you're in California or you're in New York, you have a soil strata that is the natural sort of geological soil that's there. And that co-evolved with those indigenous plants. So if you want coconut, you are going to need to look at what is the indigenous soil microbe profile and sand, silt, clay, structure, pH, all of that. How do you build the environment that then you can let the coconut tree move into? And if we work from soil up, from the ground up, you are always going to be far more successful because hopefully what will end up happening is now you're giving that indigenous plant the home support, which is the soil, you always need to water more in the beginning, right? Because you're you're triaging your plant. Mm-hmm. But then you are jumpstarting ecology. You're jumpstarting an entire, it's like a Kickstarter campaign. And then what will happen is you will be able to wean off the water and wean off the care so that it becomes self-supported. So I always tell people that low maintenance low input garden, so inputs being money, labor, and resources, Mm -hmm. low input gardens are earned. They're earned through good design practice, good installation practice, very good follow-up care for that acclimation and establishment period. And now you wean back and now you only support your plant when let's say something's going on. Yeah. But you should be able to, to back off just by investing upfront. It's a front-loaded uh, effort. Landscaping shouldn't be high maintenance if you're doing it right. I mean, there's maintenance, but it doesn't have to... Yeah, it? high maintenance to me. So this is another one of those things. Like high maintenance is relative. So my garden to somebody will seem high maintenance, but that's because I love to garden. Yeah. And I want... So if you're <laughs> going to produce food, yeah. that's relatively high maintenance. If you were to juxtapose that, let's say, to somebody who decides that they're going to have a beautiful meadow in the front and they mow it twice. Yeah. Right? So high maintenance is relative and we need to make sure that we're always juxtaposing the input profile so that 
if I have deep pockets and I want something that's a little bit more ornate and beautiful, Mm -hmm. I might be very happy to hire a garden continuum to come and maintain it for me. Whereas if I really want to be more hands off, I would, let's say, only do certain inputs, but then I would have to design that garden. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. I want to talk a little bit about pesticides and Mm -hmm. how people work with bugs and how right now, like the pesticides are harming the bees. And Noah had mentioned, you know, we're talking about Roundup and these weed killers and neonicticides and the use of them. We think of industrial ag, but they're more prevalent in our suburban homes and people just throwing Roundup on everything. And how do we get, you know, I have friends and I tell them and, you know, they, they'll they listen to my talks and stuff, but they still use that Roundup. And, you know, how do I get them to say switch to like high octane vinegar instead of the Roundup? And what can we do about that? And also, and then I'm going to bring in ticks on this too, mm-hmm. because Monique, you're Northeast, right? Are you in yes. uh, Massachusetts? Massachusetts. Yeah. So, you know, that's a real problem. And I have friends, friends who have limes and that's no joke. What can we do? Have you found ways more? Yeah. Yeah. So again, it's an equation and it it has a lot of dynamic moving parts. It took me many years to move out of the synthetic world and the the chemical world, but we eventually did it. So we're, we gave up. We don't have applicators licenses here anymore. We don't use any controlled substances at all anymore. Uh, Roundup is just not part of our story However, we do have partners that will help us if we need it. So um, I've had situations where like I was working at a school and the whole outside perimeter of the school was filled with poison ivy and the kids kept getting it because the balls would go out there. And then one kid got like deathly ill, Yeah, like his eyes swelled shut, his throat. It was just awful. It was awful. And the school was like, that's it. Like we have to do something. So we had to hire somebody to come in and they probably used something like glyphosate. We gave them a very distinct corridor that they had to treat. And then we fenced the area. Then we did a huge, uh, very, very thick layer of wood chips. And from that point forward, now the balls would fall into the wood chips, hit the fence and not go into the woodland. We were allowed to let the woodland just be native and natural, but we were able to control the area so that we were to create safety When I look at that, I see a prescriptive one and done effort to fix a problem that is dangerous for human beings. And that if we do that, it's kind of like if somebody were to decide that they would get chemo. Nobody wants chemo. Right. But if you are in a physical state, you are actually going to poison the body to heal the body. And so if we look at something like the pesticides that we have and the herbicides that we have out there, only like that, then there's this place to use them. But 99% of the time, you don't need to use them. Mm-hmm. Because if you do the, the regenerative work, you're going to create balance in the system. So we're trying to balance carbon, mm-hmm. right? So we're trying to make sure that we're drawing down carbon through the process of photosynthesis, putting it out on the soil, giving it to the microbes, building our compost so that we create this beautiful carbon sink. Well, when we build the carbon sink and we create the balance in that environment, the poison ivy doesn't thrive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's about balancing the system so that we can balance the things that we don't want out there. Now, ticks, it's not all that different. And this might be a little controversial. I'm just going to say it. But we have to balance our internal system. So if we're run down, if we're rushed, if we're full of anxiety, if we're medicated up, if we're drinking and smoking and putting caffeine and a lot of white sugar into our system, we have a rundown immune system. Bugs are attracted to that. They're attracted to the weakest plants in the landscape. So you will find plants in the wrong place and they're infested. And then the landscape company or the homeowner floods the plant with the chemical to make it not infested. But we haven't done anything to actually build the life force energy of that plant, which wants to survive, just like the human form wants to survive. Yeah. Yeah. So it's this complex equation of health. And that we really need to steward our own personal body health. And then we steward our land health. And 
0.001% of the time, maybe we, we reach for a big gun, but mm-hmm. let's hope not to. And I think one of the beautiful things that I love that Noah shared was how the bees were doing so well in the cities, yeah. but he didn't see, he's like, there's pollution in the cities. There's chemicals yeah. in the cities. I mean, people are spraying raid all over the place. Like I loved how honest and transparent he was that even amidst the issue of pesticides, which we all want to stop using. I mean, we just plain want to stop using them. But even in that, it was the biodiversity and it was the health that was making the bees able to be healthier and live longer in the cities. And that's what we need to do out in the suburbs and these people that have got these big, huge expanses of chemical treated lawns. They've got to bring in the edges and meadowize their edges and then keep the lawn in the center. That's fine. And then make that an organic lawn. Not that hard to do. Yeah. So the treatment of ticks, so like less ticks means like that if uh, humans are healthier and not, oh, so, yeah. yeah. Wow. Like without question, because when the body is expelling carbon dioxide, it's expelling more carbon dioxide when we're run down and the bugs are going to come right after that. So even mosquitoes wow. will come right after that. So if, the body burden that we're limiting with toxicity, you're doing the exact same thing in the ground. And remember that the soil is the functional digestive tract of the plant. They, okay. they have no gut, right? They yeah, have no gut. Right. The gut for them is the soil. And as we're doing all this great work to build soil, yeah. we're also, you could just say, so in the planet, so in the body. Yeah, We, we do work to build our own gut health yeah. and that's where your immune system is built. So the correlation between the life and health of our planet and the life and health of us as individual humans and collective civilizations of humans is really connected. Yeah, absolutely. There's symbiosis. Well, I love that because it really is, it's about connection. Yeah. You know, it's not competition. Even though, you know, like our plants, the plants that we love the most, they are within that competitive strategy and human beings are very similar. That's why we love the angiosperms because, you know, we're all sort of in that competitive environment, but we're looking at competition as ways to build strength and to to co-evolve together and grow and expand. And it's very positive. It's not negative, but you can't, you can't create separation. If you create separation, it becomes an us and them. Yes. It it becomes divergent and you're not looking for that. No, not at all. Not at all. So Monique, finally, I mean, we, we've come to the end. And so I (laughs) usually ask our guests, you know, how they continue to be the change and in all this. And, but I would love for you to, to discuss that, like what gets you up and continue to be change, you know, also tell us like, but you, you started being the change at a very young age, like you (laughs) knew to be the change. So has that struggle been hard for you or do you still think, oh, I should just be like a regular landscaper and like not have to fight this or do all these wonderful things? Is there a battle within you for that? I wouldn't say there's a battle because I have always thought that I'm a steward of the planet. I am a steward of the earth. Like she is my mother and I am devoted. Like I can't help myself. That first moment where I touched the soil and felt the healing effects of what was going on in that soil and in my cellular structure. Like I've always been devoted. My devotion has evolved as I've become smarter about what it is I do and where I am now. And I think the thing that really gets me up, I'll be 55 this year, which feels like a really big birthday. And I know that like my time is limited and I'm not, you know, I'm not being morbid, but like, so I think the thing that really gets me up and the thing that got me to publish this book, which was the scariest, one of the scariest things I ever did. I think I always struggled finding my voice, not inner. I always knew my inner voice is loud and it's purposeful and it knows exactly where it's going. I have a sort of this, this ability to see divine order and chaos and I guide my life that way. But I, it's been very hard for me to use my outside voice to the world and say that. So the book was was step one. It was like to get brave enough to put my thoughts on paper because that meant somebody could judge me, you know? Yeah. And so I think the thing that gets me up now is that I honestly believe that the garden continuum is a lab, which allows me to test out these ideas in a safe place with people that believe in me, my clients and my staff, 
And I look to myself now as much a gardener of people as I am a gardener of the planet. And I do a lot of work to build my corporate culture through compassion, to lean into the evolution, the co-evolution of all of our staff members so that people can come in and leave in integrity when they need to leave so that they can build their career in integrity, and so that I can start to model a business that looks different. Like, for instance, we don't work Saturdays. Almost every landscape works Saturdays. For every holiday, we take the Friday off before. So I pay them to take the Friday off before like a Monday or like for 4th of July, they're all paid to not be here on Friday and not be here on Monday. So we all have the same four-day weekends. I invest a lot in how to garden the health and well-being of my people so that my people can garden and make beautiful places for our people, our clients. And that gets me up. And I'll tell you, it's a struggle because people are hard. Like plants are way easier than people, (laughs) (laughs) way easier. And it's really hard. And sometimes I cry and sometimes I want to throw in the towel. And then I turn on a podcast like yours and I listen to the Noah Wilson Rich's podcast with you, which just blew me away. And then I just, I seriously, I called, so I called the best bee company after that and then turned out that a woman that I met years ago works there. And they called me right back. She's like, I'm so excited. You want to work with us? And I'm like, who are you? And she's like, you probably don't remember me. And like, I'm so excited now to make this connection with them. And then like Sandra Goldmark, oh my God, I cannot wait to read Fixation <laughs> because so much of what, in Care to Repair, so much of what she said, like my brain was just exploding because I'm thinking like, we have to care to, to garden. We have to care to love the land, like in the exact same way, we have to stop throwing it away. Yeah. So honestly, I'm not taking the easy path. I know I'm not taking the easy yeah. path. I really want to be a positive disruptor to the landscape industry so that the landscape industry will survive because it's so old school. It's so rough and tumble. It's so abusive to the human form. And so it's super hard, but at the same time, like I love it and it gets me out of bed every day. I'm happy to come to work. I come home exhausted, (laughs) but I, I don't imagine I'll ever really stop. It's too important. Oh, Monique, you're such an inspiration. I'm so glad we met. And it's just, again, it's by chance. And as you were saying, it's connection. Yes. So, you know, I reached out to Noah and then you are now connected with Noah and someone reached out to me about you. So it's wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm glad and I want you to keep going. Tell people, like, first of all, tell people where they can get your book, how they can follow you on Instagram or Facebook or however you want that, your website, like give it all out there. Okay. And also if a landscaper wants to learn more about how they can be a guardian instead of a custodian of the earth, can they practice with you? Like give us everything. Tell us. Okay. All right. So I'll just start with how people can generally find me. So the garden continuum.com is the best place up on the right-hand corner. There's a shop. You can just click on the shop and you can find all of my stuff. So I write two blogs, a business blog and a gardening blog. They're free. I have tons of free eBooks for landscape professionals. I got a great eBook on cash flow, which is really good for landscapers because we we've got to stay economically viable in order to do this work. It's really, really important on um, that triple bottom line piece on Instagram, I'm Monique.Allen or The Garden Continuum. So you can follow me on both of those. That's Instagram's kind of my happy place. I fade in and out. I'm a gardener. You know, we're not great with tech. And then for landscapers that want to learn this. So interestingly, I've developed a Landscapers Freedom Formula class. There's three books. They're available on the website and you can see them. And it's really about moving through developing a more compassionate culture and a triple bottom line business. And that's where it has to start because it's very difficult to just shift practice and then know that you can do it. So the book is written to address the need of a homeowner and the need of a landscape professional, because as human beings, we all need to learn to slow down and we all need to learn systems thinking. So that's an absolutely awesome starting point. And then there is a link in my website. If you're a business and you want to talk to me, um, I do a complimentary business discovery session. So totally talk to me, whether we work together or not, 
Yeah. Honestly, like I can point you in the right direction or give you the right resource or like connect you to one of the threads that I connected to that helped me to learn this stuff. The bottom line is the people, both homeowners and professionals that want to make a change. We can make global change one landscape at a time if we work together. Amazing. Amazing. And your book. So we can get your book. I know it's on Amazon, but we can buy it directly from you as well, right? You can. So you can get an autograph copy through the store. So I love to send autograph copies and make connections that way. Also, you can buy it through like IndieBound or I think bookshop.org. So you can definitely, I would highly, highly recommend that people go to kind of the local bookseller venue, even digitally, you can get it that way so that um, you support local bookstores. Amazing. Monique Allen, thank you for being the change. Thank you so much, Christine. This was wonderful. It's been a joy. I hope you enjoyed this conversation and are inspired. We grow with supporters and listeners like you. So please share this podcast with your community and follow us on Instagram at bethechange.nyc. And to learn more about our guests and what you can do to be the change, go to our website at www.bethechange.nyc. That's bethechange.nyc. Thank you and be well.